going to start? OK. All right, welcome. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of announcements before we get going with the presentation. Um, there are still plenty of seats up front. If you want to get closer, um, feel free to move up front. We do have a sign-in sheet that is being circulated. Um, if you, you know, haven't signed it yet, please, please try to locate it, and then um, we'll try to post it near the door. Or just you know, please sign it before you leave the room, if you can. And that's mainly for us to respond to any questions or anything like that if, if um, you know, we need to send out questions to the group. The meeting is being televised live on PAC TV. And it's also being, um, there are people attending via Zoom. So those people who are attending via Zoom um, and the ones in the room, um, we're going to hold off on questions until the end of the presentation. Um, if you are asking questions from within the room, if you could please come up to the microphone. Um, so that we can all hear you. And then for the ones on Zoom, Sheila from the town of Duxbury is going to be um, monitoring and, and calling on you as you raise your hand. So we'll be able to uh, put you up on the screen and you can ask your question. I think those are all the details. Um, okay, so should we start sharing screen now? Okay. All right, uh, as I said, welcome. We are here to talk about a project for building shoreline resiliency in the towns of Marshfield and Duxbury through um, beach and dune nourishment. This is a project that I personally have been working on with folks from Coastal Zone Management and the town of Marshfield and the town of Duxbury since 2020. And we're finally getting to the point where we're gonna start construction of a portion of the project. Um, I wanted to point out, just introduce the people that are here. We've got Sheila Scarzi from the town of Duxbury, who's the project manager from the town of Duxbury. Um, Michael Moresco, town manager in Marshfield. We've got Greg Gimon, who's the project manager from Marshfield. And then um, Jason Bertner, who is uh, with CZM, who has provided the lion's share of the grant funding to construct the project this winter. Um, and I thought I might like Mike, let Michael say a word if you want to. Great. Uh, thank, thank you and good evening. Oh, sorry. Uh, I just want to first of all welcome everyone here. I see a number of folks from Marshfield. It's, uh, it's great to be in Duxbury. It's not often I get invited over here to Duxbury, although Rainey and I are, are, are great friends and colleagues. Um, it's important tonight. It's great to see people out here and finding out about the project. We're very fortunate to have this project. Uh, we live in probably two of the most beautiful South Shore communities. It's important as residents uh, that we do everything possible to make sure that we protect our shoreline, our coastal zoom, uh, dunes, because that is really the safety mechanism to protect our property. And um, as you'll hear tonight, you'll, get, we'll, you'll hear about the real specifics. For those folks from Marshfield, I, I've gotten already emails wanting to know which bridges. We'll be using both of the bridges to get the sand and cobble in um, so that we're splitting up the traffic. There'll be two different traffic patterns. Um, but, you know, people have questions. You're at the right place. You ask questions. If you want to come up, I know uh, I did mention to Leslie maybe we should have people come up and look. We do have what the sand, cobble, and stone will look like. We have samples up here if anyone's interested to see that. And, uh, you know, as we move forward with the project, uh, I know I'm available to answer questions in Marshfield, and I, and I know, uh, you know, folks were available in Duxbury to answer questions as we move. But this is a great beginning to see so many people here. So uh, let's, I, I'll stop talking so we can hear the professional people. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Michael. I did forget to introduce myself. So my name is Leslie Fields. I work at the Woods Hole Group, and we are the consulting firm that has been um, working with the towns and coastal zone management to develop this project over the years. Um, next slide, please, Sheila. Okay, so this slide right here, hopefully you guys can all see this in the back. If you can't, please feel free to come up. There's, you know, half a dozen seats up here so you can uh, get a better view of the slides. So this is the meeting agenda, and I'm just gonna go over briefly the project background and goals of the project. I'll talk about the upcoming nourishment project for 2023-24, the construction schedule, and then I'll go through a series of frequently asked questions that we've gotten about this project and ones that we have anticipated, and then I'll open it up to questions both to people in the room and to those um, watching via Zoom. 
All right, so the goal, um, yeah, the goal of this project is to um, enhance the resilience of these critically eroded beaches in the towns of Marshville and Duxbury. Um, and that is being done to protect both public and private properties from storm damage. It's also being done to protect existing and future seawalls that um, are being rebuilt, um, seawalls and revetments. It's also being done to minimize wave overtopping and flooding that we get during storms behind these walls to improve the recreational beach and to restore the coastal ecosystem. So those are the reasons um, and the goals for this project. And next slide. Now, Sheila, is it possible to X out of that black thing at the top or not? Bothering me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay, if it comes back, it's not a problem. Okay. Um, the next couple of slides, if you guys have, any of you have been to the presentations I've given on this project, these are repeats of slides I've shown before. And I really wanted to include them this time and each time, really just to help the public understand why the beaches in these towns look the way they do, why they are so critically eroded, and why they're so um, starved of sand. So um, to a significant degree, the reason the beaches look the way they are is because there are so many seawalls and revetments in these towns. Um, seawalls do have benefits and then in that they are the last line of defense against erosion, um, but they also have um, adverse impacts as well. And these, these sort of graphics of here um, on the slide sort of illustrate that. The two on the left are cross sections of um, a natural beach without a seawall. And what you can see is um, that the, the top left slide is sort of the initial profile of the beach. You can see the water level and the width of the beach there with the dunes behind. And then over time, as sea level rises and there's storms, that beach migrates landward. It's translated landward. And that's a natural process and that can happen on a natural beach because there's not any sort of hardened shore protection structures behind it that stop the beach from migrating. So that's sort of a natural process of beach evolution and, and um, rollover that, that we see. The two slides on the right are slides of a beach with a seawall in it. And you can see initially in the top right slide, or the top right graphic, um, you've got the seawall with a nice wide beach out front and the water level is, is um, at high tide. It's, it's you know, a significant distance off the seawall. It's not touching the seawall at all. But over time, as we have sea level rise and erosion, the elevation of that beach is lowered and, and erodes, and eventually um, the, the water level is, or the high tide line, is right at the face of the seawall. Um, and that uh, the, the beach can't migrate landward because the seawall is there. And um, that's the situation that we're at right now in the towns of Duxbury and Marshfield, and in many cases, um, where the, the the beach has eroded so much and dropped in elevation such that um, there's, there's no sediment supply, the beach can't migrate anymore, so it's lowering in elevation, and at high tide, high tide line is hitting the face of that seawall. And because the beaches are armored with the seawalls, there's no new influx of sediment. In a natural system, when you have a, a bank or a dune um, that's not armored, and you have a storm, that dune and bank can erode and that system is supplied to the, to the beach. And that's what helps maintain the beach. In these situations here, when you have seawalls and revetments, there's no more set, source of sediment. And so that's another reason why the beaches are so critically eroded. Um, so um, in the towns of Marshfield, we've got about 83% of the shoreline is armored with seawalls and revetments. And in Duxbury, the, the northern part of the beach, um, north of Duxbury Beach Reservation, 91% of the shoreline is armored. Um, what else was I going to say here? So up in, in the words up in the upper right-hand corner just sort of reiterates what I just went over. So um, with the seawalls in place, you've got lower beach elevations. When those beach elevations drop, you get deeper water occurring during storms. Deeper water during storms translates to bigger waves. The deeper the water, 
the, the, the bigger the wave it will support. If you have shallow water, you get smaller waves. Deeper water, you get bigger waves. Um, with larger waves, there's more wave overtopping. Many of you who live along these seawalls and behind them have experienced that during storms with significant wave overtopping. Um, and with more wave overtopping, you've got increased damage to public and private properties behind the seawalls. Um, as far as beach nourishment goes, the intent of the beach nourishment is to um, provide protection for those seawalls to keep them from being impacted during storms by these larger waves and to minimize the amount of overtopping. Uh, we know the town of Duxbury is in the middle of a seawall reconstruction project um, to raise the elevation of the seawall. Um, this project is only going to help um, those seawalls in conjunction with those seawalls to protect those properties. So as I said before, when the seawalls are, are reconstructed, if this nourishment is out in front, the nourishment will help to protect the seawalls, minimize wave overtopping, and protect the properties behind. Okay, next slide. Okay, accomplishments to date. So this just summarizes the, the grants that we have received from CZM for this project. And in fiscal year 2020, the towns, both towns together, um, had a project that was worth $234,546. That's a combination of both grant funds and town matching funds. And so that money was used to identify beaches that were suitable for beach nourishment and to develop engineering designs for beach nourishment. Then in fiscal year 21, they received another grant worth $281,318. And for that um, amount, we filed the permit applications for the beach nourishment. And there's a, a suite of uh, six different permits we need for the nourishment projects. It's not a trivial process to get permits these days. Um, that's one reason why there's uh, sort of a, a that was, that's an expensive task. In FY23, they received $94,141 to continue the permitting process, to follow up with those permit applications, respond to questions from the agencies, um, and ensure that those permits are issued. And then in FY24, which is the year that we're in now, the project year we're in now, the towns have $4.3 million. And that's a combination, again, from funds from CZM and um, from town matching funds, and that's to construct a beach nourishment project at the southern end here, so at the Bay Ave Gurnet Road um, beach area. So uh, I apologize that it's low, and those of you can't see it, but it's, it's areas south of um, the Green Harbor Inlet. Um, so, yeah, this area was prioritized by both towns as, as an area that they wanted to start first with the beach nourishment. That's why we decided to work there first. So Marshfield has uh, about 1.46 million for project construction. That's 35% of the projected volume that we'll put on the beach. And Duxbury has 2.6 in round numbers, 2.6 million for project construction, or 64% of the project of the volume that we'll place on the beach. All right. Um, okay, so this slide here shows what the uh, permitted design was. This is what this is the design that we came up with for um, building this project. It covers extends from north of Pearl Street in Marshfield to the end of Ocean Road South in Duxbury. So that's that yellow polygon that you see there on the slide. It's 38.1 acres. Um, it would take 480 some odd thousand cubic yards of mixed sand, gravel, and cobble. Um, to construct this, and I'll talk more about that grain size characteristics in a little bit. Um, it's 5,090 linear feet, about 900 feet in Marshfield, and 4,190 feet in Duxbury. Um, it is designed to be in front of 16 properties in Marshfield and 66 properties in Duxbury. And it provides, the, the, the design provides protection for storm damage protection, reduced wave overtopping, recreation, and shorebird habitat. So this is the permitted design that, that we came up with. You go to the next slide. Okay. What we see here is a comparison of the permitted design. So that's the area that's sort of crosshatched. 
right there. And then the yellow polygon is the area that we hope to be able to nourish this year in 2023-2024. Um, it's smaller than the permitted footprint because we don't have enough money. Even though we have $4.2 million, we don't have enough money to do the entire project. Um, So, yeah, so the fact that this is smaller is really dictated by the fact that, you know, we've got a cap on the amount of money we can spend uh, as a combination of grant funding and town match funding. Um, and it's also a factor of the cost of the sand. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit. Um, we believe we're going to get enough funding to place about 16 to 20 percent of that total volume that I showed you on the previous slide. So 16, 20% of the volume that I showed you on the previous slide. So it's about 75 to 100,000 cubic yards of material, as opposed to the design, which was 480,000. Um, again, Marshfield will get 35% of the volume, Duxbury 64%. We've already put the project out to bid, so contractors are providing you know, bids to, to build the project. Those are due to the town of Marshfield tomorrow. Um, once we get those bids and we know how much the sand is going to cost, we're going to spend time to optimize this smaller nourishment design. And what I mean by that is we're going to um, revise the design, whether it's the length of design, the width, um, length or width, to, um, to maximize sort of the, the, the design and the level of protection that it provides. So this yellow polygon I'm showing you here, the volume and the linear footage, those are estimates they will be refined once we get the bids from the contractors. And this is something that we can post on the town websites as far as updated graphics and, and dimensions and things like that to show you, you know, what the nourishment footprint will look like once we, once we finally get those bids. This is a cross section, this next slide, cross section of um, the two nourishment designs. So the yellow cross section, the bigger one, is um, what was permitted. The green cross section is what we hope to be able to build with the amount of money that we have um, given the, the unit rates of sand that we're going to get from the contractors. So the original design had a berm elevation, that's the highest part up there against the seawall, of 11 feet above the a datum we use in AVD. You can think of it kind of as mean sea level. Um, and that berm was at elevation 11 and it extended out from the sea walls at 90 feet. And then from there it sloped down 15 horizontal to one to meet the natural grade of the near shore area. Now, because we have you know funding limitations um, and we have a smaller volume of material that we can put on the beach, we had to modify that design. And this, as I said, is, is, a, is an interim one. We're going to refine this even more once we get the bids. But we're thinking that we're going to reduce that berm elevation to eight, elevation eight. It's going to be 40 to 50 feet wide. It will still slope seaward at a, at a slope of 15 horizontal to one vertical. And so you can see the difference between the two cross sections. Um, the other thing we, we can talk about now, I guess, is, is that we're going to be using a mixture of sand and gravel and cobble for the beach, for the nourishment. Um, I think the next couple slides I'll talk more about that. Um, one thing I would point out, the little gray dash line, horizontal line going through the graph, that's the elevation of mean high water. So you can see how right now, if you compare the elevation of that gray dash line with the black line, that's the existing profile. That hits the face of the seawall or very nearly the toe of the seawall. With this design that we're hoping to build this winter, we're going to be able to push that line 150 feet seaward. So at high water, at, at, at high tide, you're not going to have high tide lapping up against the face of the seawall. That just gives you a measure of sort of what to expect. All right, um, so now I'm going to get into some of the uh, specifics about construction. 
So we have two access points for the project, one in Marshfield, one in Duxbury. The one in Marshfield is the Bay Ave ramp off of Bay Ave. And this graphic that I'm showing you here shows the trucking route to that access point. So it comes down Route 139 and then down Beach Road, down Bay Ave. They'll back in to the Bay Ave ramp, dump the material, and then um, pull out, turn right back up Beach Ave, or back up Bay Ave, left on Beach, and then back on 139. We're expecting about 50 trucks a day. Monday to Friday, 7 a.m. to 5, mid-December through the end of February. That's the, that's the northern access point. Um, this next slide here just gives you an idea of what we anticipate the contractors will be doing once they dump that material. So this um, access point at the, I guess the top, top part of the slide is that Bay Ave ramp. And we expect them, as I said, to dump that material at the end of the ramp and sort of build a, a ledge or a platform that they can then work from and push the material with dozers out onto the beach in according to the design and cross-section cross that I showed you earlier. So they'll stockpile there at the end of the ramp and then doze it north and south. The uh, area off of is that Avon Street? Avon, yes. Avon Street is um, an area where um, we'll be staging some trucks and things like that. Not big delivery trucks, but trucks for the contractors who are working on the beach and driving the dozers and things like that. There will be some equipment stored in that lot. All right, next slide. Okay, this slide here shows the southern access point. And so this is on Duxbury Beach Reservation property. It's on their <coughs> northern parking lot. The access route for the truck's delivering material comes down 139, takes a right on Canal Street, down to Gurnett Road, and then enters the DBR property, enters that northern lot, um, and, and dumps the material, and then exits the same route. Here we're expecting 50 to 100 trucks a day, Monday to Friday, 7 to 5, mid-December to the end of March. Uh, this graphic here shows uh, how the activity is going to occur at that Duxbury Beach northern lot. So as I said, they're going to come along Gurnett Road, take a left into this parking lot. They'll back up into that area that's shown in yellow. That's going to be a stockpile area where they'll dump material. And they'll build a stockpile of material in that lot there. Um, they'll also have, we believe, two what they call end dump trucks, which are trucks that can roll up and down the beach. They've got rubber tires, um, and they will be loaded with material from this stockpile area by front end loaders. And then they'll drive over a construction access that we're going to create over the dune at that lot. And they'll drive up the beach to the southern end to meet the Bay Ave nourishment that's being dozed from the north. Um, I think that's all I need to say about that. We can always have questions. As far as the schedule goes, I think I've alluded to this before, but this slide just shows it. Um, we did publish the town of Marshfield, um, did publish an invitation to bid for the contractors on November 20th of this year. Bids are due tomorrow, December 6th. Uh, we expect the contract to be issued on December 11th and the start of construction to be sometime between December 15th and December 22nd. Um, we expect that the end of construction at the Bay Ave site will be at the end of February, and the end of construction at the Duxbury Beach Reservation site to be the end of March. So that site there is dictated by um, uh, the birds. So we, we have to be off the beach um, you know, before the beginning of April in order to protect the endangered and threatened shorebirds. All right, now I'm going to get into a series of questions that we've anticipated you all might have and ones that we've received. Um, the first one is, you know, what type of sediment are we going to be using for the nourishment? So according to our permits and, and according to what we know is best for the beach, we're trying to match 
what's on the beach right now with this source material coming to the beach. And what we know over a series of surveys conducted between 2019 and uh, just October of this year is that the beach is composed of about 3 to 10 percent cobble, and cobble is anything bigger than two and a half inches. It's like your fist or, you know, a little bit smaller than your child's fist on up. Um, about 15 to 20 percent gravel, and then about 60 to 78 percent sand. So that's the, that's the specification that we provided to the contractors that they need to meet in order to provide compatible material. Um, the sediments will be mixed throughout the beach. There will be some mixing in that DBR parking lot and some mixing on the beach as it's spread. And I've given you some pictures of some uh, uh, different sediment substrates that we've been out mapping. You can see the lower right is primarily sand with a little bit of gravel mixed in. Um, the one on the left is cobble mixed with gravel, gravel, and the one up top is gravel mixed with sand interspersed. We do find a lot of times on this beach that you get these <coughs> patches of gravelly or cobbly areas right next to sandy areas. And many of you who are out there walking the beach every day, I'm sure, have seen these areas. So um, that's, that, that's, we know that once we put the material down, Mother Nature is going to reorient the material and it's going to look like that again, but we're trying to replicate those different sediment characteristics with this nourishment material. Um, why can't the sand be nourished with sand to make a better recreational beat? That's a question we thought, you know, we, we, we've heard. Um, first of all, the permits, as I said, require that we put material that's compatible with what's on the beach right now. And as I said, we know from sediment surveys conducted from 2019 to 2023, we've got about 70 percent sand about and about 20 percent or 70 to 80 percent sand and about 20 to 30 percent gravel and cobble and i just provided you the the different um, measurements and in inches so you can sort of get a picture of what the different grain sizes are but as michael mentioned i did bring some samples from the beach there's a bucket down there to the right of where jason is that has um, both cobble and gravel in it if you want to come up and just get an idea of what that looks like and then there's a bag on the beach on the table that has um, gravel mixed with sand. So those are just uh, to give you an idea of what that material looks like. Um, we know that people have complained or, or are concerned about the extent of the coarser grain material that we're proposing. Um, but we want you to know that the bigger that material is, um, it helps to maintain the beach longer. Um, since it takes bigger waves in order to move that grain size, that bigger grain size off the beach, some of that coarser material is going to help with longevity of this project. And we know that the sandier material, while there is a lot of it there on the beach, a lot of that is more easily mobilized and moving into the near shore and along shore. Um, and then, as I just said, we know that once we put this material down, it's all going to be redistributed uh, distributed by the waves. Um, to look a lot like what you see on the beaches right now. Sort of these patchy areas of gravel and cobble, or maybe they're linear, but it sort of um, uh, brings a lot of that coarser grain material together into to patches on the beach. Um, where will the sediment come from? So the nourishment material is going to be sourced from sand and gravel pits um, in, in you know, these towns, both towns, and in neighboring counties. Um, the up, it's all going to be upland material. It's going to have a reddish tint to it when it's originally brought to the beach. It's going to look redder than the natural beach sand that you see because it hasn't been bleached by the sun. Um, and, you know, some of the finds that are in there are still in there when it's initially brought to the beach and they will be winnowed out and, and uh, transported offshore over time. So it will look red in the beginning. You can sort of see that in this left-hand picture. This is a project that we did at Duxbury Beach Reservation last year. And you can see some of that upland sand is redder in color. But over time, that was just the following summer, less than six months after, you can see that it's bleached out and um, looks a lot like what you have now on the beaches. Um, how will the sediment get to the beach? Um, it's going to be trucked to the beach, as I said before, in tractor trailers. 
Um, I talked about what was going on at the Bay Ave ramp. It's going to be dumped directly off the end of that ramp and then pushed along and graded along the beach with a front end loader at the south end. As I said, we're going to dump in that DBR northern lot and then um, load up end dumps, traverse across the, the dune, and then um, up to the meet the southern end of the Bay Ave project. It's going to take about three to three and a half months to complete, so between mid-December and the end of March. As I said before, um, it's going to be about 100 tri truck trips a day coming to these sites. Um, how are the, I've already been through this, so here's just pictures of the two access ramps, access points. So the top one is the Bay Ave site, and they're going to dump uh, back right up to the end of this ramp. We're going to have some sort of protection there at the end of the ramp so that the ramp concrete is not damaged. Um, but they're going to dump, uh, come right up to that and dump on the beach and then pushed out with a grader. This lower picture here is a picture of one of the access ramps that we had at the Duxbury Beach project we did last year just coming up and over the dune. So that's what it's going to look like at the DBR northern lot. And when we're done, the contractor is required to restore both sites to the way they were before they got there. So um, at the DBR lot, that means um, regrading the parking lot. It means bringing in sand to restore the elevation of the dune in that access point to match that on either side. And it also means revegetating that area that they traversed. Um, so what, what are they going to, are there going to be any controls for public safety? So we are expecting some electronic and or temporary signage out on 139 and on the different access routes for the trucks to direct those trucks um, so that they know where they're going. We're also going to have some detour signs to direct local traffic to try to stay away from um, the Bay Ave ramp if possible. I mean, there's got to be some traffic in there if you live in there, but to try to direct most of the traffic away from those areas. Um, if the traffic congestion becomes a problem, the bid specifications for the contractors um, indicated that they needed to carry allowance, an allowance for a police detail. So if the contractor thinks it's, it's a problem with traffic congestion, or if the town of Marshfield thinks it's a problem at the Bay Ave area, then we will have a police detail out there directing traffic. We don't think we need one at the DBR lot because there's a lot less traffic down there. As far as um, speeding, we had some concerns over the trucks traveling uh, really fast down Canal Street and Gurnet, Gurnet Road. So, um, you know, the police will be out there periodically checking, making sure they're not speeding. If it becomes a problem, we can consider putting up some of those electronic speed limit signs. Um, so there's a number of measures, steps we can take to control that. <coughs> will the public still have access to the beach? We are going to prevent the public from at using the Bay Ave ramp during construction and that DBR northern lot, but you will still have access to the beach. Um, you can walk up and down the beach like you're doing now. We do ask that you exercise caution around the construction equipment. Um, there may be certain days when, you know, they're doing construction in an area and you might have to turn around sooner than you thought, so um, on your walk, but, you know, for the large part, the beach is going to be open for the public the way it is now. How long will the nourishment last? Um, the original engineering analyses that we did for the larger permitted design showed that we would need to come back in and re nourish the beaches about every five years. And there's an engineering criteria that says you should re nourish when 80% of the material that you originally put down is no longer in that original footprint. So when 80% is gone and moved on, whether it's in the near shore or long shore, that's when you should come in and re-nourish. So our original calculations for the bigger project show that you needed to do that about every five years. We have a much smaller project this time, and so we're, going, we're not going to get you know, that sort of longevity at all. And, and we want people to have the proper expectation of this project and that there's going to be both spreading to the, to the north and south, along shore in the beach, and to the near shore. Um, and so it's going to spread, as I said, more quickly than the larger project um, in order to meet this equilibrium profile, in order to come into equilibrium with the waves and water levels that are, that are present on the beach. Um, 
Yeah, and this is just sort of a normal process in sediment starved beaches is that, you know, you need to expect with a beach nourishment project, you're going to get spreading both, you know, along shore and, and cross shore. Um, this picture here just really, I guess, I, I, uh, words are the same as the previous slide, but I just included this picture down here at the bottom that shows cross-shore or offshore movement of sediment into the nearshore zone and then spreading to the north and south. So that's something that we need to all expect. And then I think the last, you know, my last slide is, um, you know, are there going to be Im any impacts to water quality? during this project. So with some of the sandy material, there's going to be some, uh, some degree of fines in that material. We have specified, you know, very small percentages of that, and the contractors need to meet that, but there's going to be some degree of fines. When the waves hit those fines, when the tide comes up, some of that's going to be washed into the nearshore, and there could well be some um, increased turbidity in the nearshore zone. With projects that we've done before and, and, and others um, all across the country, um, you know, this, this increase in turbidity is really short-lived. At the most, it's, you know, one to two days. You might expect to see some increased turbidity out there, but beyond that, it's going to look just like it does now. Um, and, yeah, so I, I guess that's really it. Um, there's some pictures right here. Well, let's go back for a minute, please. So I think this is the DBR property that we did. Uh, uh, last winter, and so you can see a little bit of turbidity out there in the nearshore area. And then this project here at the, the bottom slide is one over on the vineyard where um, you can hardly see any sort of turbidity at all. So there's, you know, there's a big difference in the type of material that you're using to nourish the beach with. If there are uh, more fines in the material, you're going to see more turbidity. But we're trying to control that by, by uh, limiting the amount of fines that the contractors can, can um, <coughs> include in the source material. So that's all I have right now, and I'm certainly willing to answer any questions that you guys might have. I will say that on this slide here, I've given out Greg and Sheila's email addresses <laughs> um, in case you have questions um, that you'd like to ask. Michael also said that he was willing to answer questions, so, um, and, you know, certainly um, we can also answer questions. So um, if, if you think of a question later on that you're not asking tonight, you know, feel free to reach out to one of these people and, and get your uh, questions answered. All right, thank you. All right, so we've got, uh, yeah. Uh, Candace Martin, 59 Granite Road. Um, just on bringing the material in, you noted 50 trucks per day to each of the sites on Bay Ave and um, the beach reservation. Is that based on the original quantity or is that calculated down based on the reduced project? Yeah, that is based on the original. So it could be a, it could be a little bit less, Candace, yeah. Right. Is there any reason why, because most of the sand is near the Bay Ave location, do they have to go down to the, is there a requirement to split the trucks between the two locations? There is not a requirement, but we need both locations in order to get that volume of material on the beach in the amount of time we have. Okay. We can't have, we can't build it all from the Bay Ave ramp. There's just no way. All right. So originally the project was about 35% of the total coverage, and now we're down to 16. Um, will we get updates on what the total project cost would be um, and to forecast for capital funding and grants for the next few years? Because we're only doing a small portion and we need to do the rest. And related to that, because the sand is expensive, I know many years ago, when they dredged the harbor, the sand was placed directly onto the beach. And because of new regulations, they dump it out in the ocean and then it floats away. Is there, now that we have the permits in place, can that <coughs> dredging material be added directly from where it left the beach? All right, two questions. The first one, will we provide um, estimates of, you know, future <coughs> money is needed for future nourishment projects. We will certainly work with CZM to, to develop those estimates and, um, you know, share that with the towns and, you know, we can, the towns can decide what sorts of capital expenditures are needed if they want to proceed with future nourishment. Um, second question was, what was the second one? I totally Dredge, forgot. Dredging of the heart. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have tried to work with the Corps of Engineers. The Corps of Engineers are the ones who dredge Green Harbor. It's a federal navigation project. 
We have tried to work with them over a number of years throughout these projects to try to find a way to get that material straight, the dredge straight from the harbor and put directly on the beach. Um, over the years, and I, know, and I know that that used to happen years ago, it was pumped directly onto the beach years ago. Right, but we didn't have the permit to now put it on to the beach. And yeah. You, now we do. So Now you do. But over the years, that material that lands in the harbor has become much coarser. It's, it's the cobble and the gravel that you see in these bags over here, much of it. And so the core is not able to dredge that cobble and gravel hydraulically and pump it to any beach, much less these beaches. That method of dredging doesn't work for that coarser grain material. So what they do is they dredge it mechanically and they put it in the, the scow that then is used to take the material out to the open water disposal site and dump it in the near shore. Um, there is some, has been talk about trying to move that site closer to the shoreline so that the material would have a better chance of migrating on shore. I think we at Woods Hole Group are skeptical that we could um, design that given the, the draft or the depth that that barge needs in order to open up the bottom of the scow and dump the material. It needs a certain depth at low water in order to do that without grounding out. And so it's not able to get much closer than where it already is. So we're, we're, um, we're not optimistic about that as a method of getting material to the beaches. We did talk about potentially um, trucking it through Marshfield, but the cost of that is, is exorbitant. Um, one thing that the harbor master just asked about not too long ago was whether or not we could um, take material that's already on the beach right, I want to say south, but maybe it's, I'm going to say below the, the southern jetty. Burke's Beach. Yeah, take it from Burke's Beach and move it further south in, into Marshfield. And so that is definitely something that could be done, in, in our opinion. It's not something that's permitted, but at least the, the, the removal of sand from that part is not permitted. The placement in the, in the nourishment area is permitted, and we're going to keep those permits valid and active. Okay. So that's kind of a long-winded answer to your question. We're, we're trying to use that material, but it's not, not been easy. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Frank Bettolino, 45 Canal Street. I'm not an engineer, but I don't understand when you've got the seawall and you're going to pack it up higher with gravel and sand. Is that what the whole idea is on this uh, project? Yeah, we're going to put sand and gravel and cobble on the beach in front of the seawall. I don't know about packing it, but yeah, we're going we're gonna to put it on, yeah, to raise the elevation of the beach. So you're just going to raise up what's there. Don't you think the tide is going to take some of that out of there? Yes, it will move it around. I, yes, yeah. Most definitely. But it won't come back. It's going to disappear, right? Okay. Well, so that it's important to note that in a sand-starved system um, that, you know, we're, if, we're, we're going to put material in a nourishment footprint, a defined footprint. That material is going to move outside of that footprint, both north and south at this site and some in the near shore. But in a sand-starved system, any material you can get and put in that system is, is a benefit. Okay. All right. And uh, Marshfield is going to take the blunt of all these trucks. 50 to 100 trucks a day. We yes, sir. We live on Canal Street, and they come around that bend, and I, there is more than one contractor involved in this project with the trucks because I saw a lot of trucks go down here, and they weren't all the same contractors. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Because that bridge trucking. just got repaired a few years back, but they didn't complete the whole job from what I understand. I don't know so much about that, but... Well, um, they didn't do the sidewalks on the oh, sides. Okay. Yeah. I asked the guy, but you could, no, we don't have they enough didn't money. Do the platforms, though. Oh, yeah, Actually, you did enough for the trucks to go and the cars, but they didn't do the sidewalk where the timber is walking there. Yeah, I'm not really uh, sure about that, but I will tell you that the platforms uh, on both bridges were done, and in fact, uh, residents of Duxbury actually contributed $75,000 of their Chapter 90 money because so much of the Duxbury traffic goes over Correct. that particular bridge. So, Doing And people will be monitoring to make sure. That's why the speed uh, of the trucks, there'll be, there'll be great enforcement, making sure that it's safe for 
you know, Marshfield residents or any Duxbury residents that are walking out in those well, areas. The problem is when they come off of 139 to come down to Canal Street, that corner shop. And some of these guys with these 16 wheelers that have Jake Brights, and they throw those on because I don't live too far from there. For, you know, and I'm backing out of there, or driving out of there, and a truck comes, it's all over. All right, and I've seen them speed down that road, and it's, it's really terrible. And you say they're gonna have police there, they're always there at the wrong times, but you can't help that. That's the way it goes, you know? So, but, uh, so now this summer we'll be walking with sandals on the beach, correct? Good, yeah, sure. Because you can't go barefoot anymore with the, uh, oh. all these stuff. It's gonna look a lot down. like what it looks like now. Yeah. Well, Duxbury looked nice on their beach on the sand. We won't have any. Are you in Marshfield or Duxbury? I don't know. Marshfield. Marshfield, okay. And the Burke's Beach is okay. That's all sand. Or is that going to have the same thing? It's going to, we're not, not touching, touching Burke's, Burke's Beach. Well, I know that, yeah. but it's got the sand. Yeah. But uh, when you go to. I expect Burke's Beach to look much the same as it does now. And then Green Harbor will have all the uh, gravel. Well, Green Harbor has gravel right now. Yeah. I don't think the gravel is going to move up through Burke's Beach and into, no, into but Green Harbor. No, that's not point, but when you go there, there is sand there in the summertime. Yeah. Uh, green, yeah. You know. I expect that to be there still. Okay. And, 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 you know, it'll be a mixture of sand and cobble and gravel, just like what you have now. And now, if we have problems with these trucks, do we come and see you? That, <laughs> that is correct. If, if, there's a, if there's a problem with the trucks, by all means, call me, and I'll make sure we have police down there. Uh, police will be monitoring that to make sure that residents, children, the school buses, all of that stuff are protected. Uh, Jake brakes, you know, we'll make sure that that's on the sign for them not to be using the Jake brake because it is very loud and very disruptive. And then when they come back out of Canal, they got to get back out of Caswell. So that could be a tie up there too with trucks. Yeah. Especially if you've got 50 or 100 trucks. That's a lot of trucking. It is so. less trucks than we had last winter. Less. I also live off of Canal Street, right by the Assumption Church. Okay. And my wife heard the trucks because she was working at home, yep. and it was every two minutes last yes. year. Was, there was, was a to, lot yeah, more a material lot last year than we're going to have this year. So, but, but we still have 50 or 100 trucks? It's less than we had before. Yeah. I never counted year. them, but I, you know, it seemed like a lot of them. All right. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for your questions. Good evening, my name is Stan Wheatley. I live at 1548 Tremont Street in Duxbury. Um, and I come here tonight as someone who's still suffering PTSD from the Duxbury Reservation Project earlier this year. Uh, the truck traffic was intolerable um, and that's my issue. Um, from what I'm hearing tonight, you have not yet awarded any contracts? Correct. Okay, so you don't know where the material is gonna come from exactly yet? Uh, not exactly. We have an idea, but we don't know exactly. What's yet. the idea, if I may ask? Um, just various sand and gravel pits, you know, in the area. Is this going to be another Duxbury construction? I don't know. Project? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, okay. Um, what did the invitation for bids have to say about traffic mitigation, noise, speed limits, engine braking, unnecessary use of the horns? Was that addressed in the in the invitation? The traffic pattern was but what splitting are, it in onto the two streets. Okay. But what about the noise? What about the speeding? What about the jake braking? What about the unnecessary use of the horns? We, d we did uh, have information in there about, you know, obeying speed limits. And I believe there was something in there about, you know, no jake braking. I'd have to go back and look for sure. Okay. When, we, when, yeah, I just want to say that once we do select a contractor, I mean, those things are going to be addressed again with the selected contractor to make sure that they're not, you know, doing those things. Will the bids be available to the public tomorrow? Because it makes a big difference who the contractor is. Duxbury Construction used several contractors, mm -hmm. and some of them were fine. At least one of them was, I think, should be disqualified. Okay. I don't know what the, what the process is, whether or not those bids are open to the public I don't know what that process is do you know Michael the, yes the opening of the bids is a, is a public process we open them in a public area people can come they read the uh, information in and then the uh, Marshfield DP Board of Public Works would then vote on issuing the contract to the lowest most qualified bidder and those are not rules we make up those are the rules of the Commonwealth no, I understand that. Um, who, who are the contracting parties who, who issued the invitation to bid 
T town of Marshfield Marshall. and town of Marshfield. Yeah, town of Marshfield. Okay, and is contemplated that there's going to be a general contractor who's then going to have subs underneath him, or is the general contractor going to do the whole job with their own equipment and their own forces? I think it it could vary depending on which contractor is selected. Okay, because again, the in, the actual the specific trucking company that does the work makes a huge difference. Here. Yeah, I, um, I, some I, of them are just completely irresponsible. Some of them are fine. I do expect that almost all of the of the contractors will be using you know trucking companies mm -hmm. so i don't think that they have their own capacity to to you know with trucks to to bring this material to the beaches themselves so they mm -hmm. are going to contract that out okay so i mean if there's some you know we, we can try to address that when we select the contractor to put controls on you know those things that you've said that are so disturbing speeding jake brakes horns things like that in equipment um, the most offensive contractor, every single one of his trucks has an illegal exhaust system on it. Hmm. What does the, the, I assume the bid, the invitation to bid doesn't say anything about decibel levels of the exhaust system or, or non-standard exhausts. Uh, not that I'm aware of, but uh, construction companies like anyone else have to follow the rules uh, of, of the road. So if someone has, you know, if they're breaking the law and they have wrong equipment, you know, the fine can be issued to them. See, that's the problem. They don't, at least one of them doesn't follow the rules. At least one of them is, is a scofflaw. Um, now, there was some discussion of police enforcement in Marshfield. Uh, Sheila, can you address police enforcement in Duxbury? Because, again, for the DBR project, there was zero police enforcement in Duxbury. Zero. My wife and I complained several times to DBR. Mm -hmm. We complained to Duxbury Construction. We complained to the Duxbury Police. Literally nothing was done. Yeah, so definitely reach out to me and let me know if you're observing issues, uh, and I will be in touch with the police department to make sure we can do something about it. Okay, and, and another question is, have you looked at alternate routes? I mean, based on the presentation tonight, every single truck is gonna go in front of my house on Tremont Street, which is 139. Is, have you thought about bringing some of the material in through Marshfield Center and down Webster Street? I'm not saying, you know, spread the pain around. I'm not saying I should be immune from the pain, but spread it around. Is that a possibility? You know, we just looked right in the immediate vicinity of the project, so, you know, 139 and then to the roads that lead to these two access points. If there's other routes sort of beyond 139 that could be taken, um, you know, we can talk to the contractor about that. And, and a lot of it will depend on where the material is coming from. Yeah, exactly. I, I, that's why I, yeah. I, I began with that question. Where is this yeah. coming from? You don't really know yet. We don't know yet, yeah. We were supposed to have bid, opened the bids already, so we would have known some of yeah. this information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But several of the contractors had multiple questions, and they kept having to get answers, which have pushed out the bid opening. Mm -hmm. Okay, well... I mean, it, it sounds like it's too early to really address a lot of my questions, but uh, I think you can hear my concerns. Anyway. Yeah, I can. Thank you. Appreciate your sharing. Right. Thank you. Uh, Mark White, 25 BF. My questions have to do with the erosion characteristics of the project, and um, just a couple questions, and I won't, won't be lengthy, but. Um, you had mentioned that we have to anticipate having to re nourish the beach after five years of it being applied. Do I have that right? That's true if we were to have built the large 480,000 okay. cubic yard project. Okay. So we should expect re nourishment being needed sooner than that, therefore. Okay. Some period of time, let's call it two or three years. So, a question for CZM then is the grant that's been awarded to the town, appreciate it very much. Is CZM treating this project as a phase project and therefore um, the subsequent phases of this project and re-nourishment are going to be given some priority at CZM for additional grant funding cycles or is it going to be a brand new application process competitive when that becomes necessary? Um, so uh, um, thanks for the question. Um, each round of grant funding from CZM is its each individual grant round, and those are competitive grants. So, um, so each 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 grant is is new, 
or each each grant round is new each application process is new that said there is language in the um, scoring criteria which does give some additional points to projects that build on previously funded projects okay. and multi-community and multi-community projects as well okay okay and um, questions for both Marshfield and Duxbury is, is there uh, capital funds being set aside to do beach nourishment going forward or is that going to be new town meeting articles as they come up I can answer for Marshfield that would be new town meeting articles as they come up depending on available finances okay it would be the same for Duxbury okay I, I know I know in the town of Duxbury that in the past few years they've had a, a sort of a standard town meeting article to set aside two hundred fifty thousand dollars each year for resiliency projects okay so a lot of the towns match has come from several years of that that uh, article being passed Okay, and last question um, is that for the those of us who live on the beach, we can see what the effects of the erosion are with severe uh, winter storms and summer storms and the impact it has on transporting the sediment and the sand away very, very quickly. Were there any concepts given to, uh, what is your experience in this type of beach nourishment project in terms of its longevity of the, of the material that's placed there and were there options considered such as you know small-scale growing systems that we see on the Cape and others to help keep the um, the sand in place. Yeah, so we've been over the longevity part. So you know, with a bigger project, we'd anticipate you'd need to come back in and re-nourish every five years. Mm -hmm. With a smaller project, it's going to be more frequent than that. If you want to maintain, you know, that that criteria that we re-nourish when 80% of the material that we put in this specific box is somewhere else. Um, so, we, you know, we exp that's, it's going to be quicker than five years with a much smaller project. Um, we did in the very first year of grant funding look at alternatives for providing additional resiliency to these beaches, things like, you know, groins or offshore breakwaters or, you know, bigger, taller revetments, things like that. Um, and, um, you know, basically found that beach nourishment was the, the best alternative, the most practical one, and the one that would not result in adverse impacts to adjacent neighboring beaches which is something you get a lot with groins mm. okay thank you yeah hi i'm uh, rich mcginnis leslie hi i live at um uh, 56 plymouth ave and 49 gurnet road um thank you first of all we're excited that this project's happening so it's it's been long in the, in the in the wait, long in the wait, waiting. So I'm just thanking everyone that this project is moving along. Um, my first question is about the 80% loss. Who monitors that? And is there follow up? Like when we're getting close to it, do both towns start mobilizing and seeking funds? And I'm not sure what the match is from CZM on this project. Yeah, so we do need to monitor the beach. We have, you know, a post construction survey and then annual surveys, or even after a big storm, there would who's, be a survey. Who's we? Is it Woods, Woods Hole, Hole Group? group. Yeah. So you're on contract? Well, we're not on contract yet, but we, you know, we will be um, at some point. Um, and what was the other question? On the town side, um, we need to not wait. We need yeah. to start saving now small pots of money. And I had right. mentioned that last night at the select board meeting on the multi-hazard mitigation plan discussion. So along the lines of what Duxbury's been doing, I think is a great plan just to, you know, set aside, sort of have a standard article that sets aside a, a set amount of money that you can sort of bank for things like this or, or other projects. Mm -hmm. But which whole group would be advising on the any loss over the years or are you just yes to, okay. yeah and, and the towns also have survey capabilities they can go out there and do some of that work too and feed mm -hmm. that to us and we can take a look at it so and, and what the, was the difference in the cost from the the bigger project to the smaller scale project i'd have to go back and look i'm okay. I, i'm apologize i don't have that on the top of my tongue okay. here and I, tongue. I own one of the dune parcels that okay. they have and that's going to be rehabbed as well and is it just seagrass 
that's in the planting mix or there are other plantings? Okay, that's a really good question. On this project this winter, we are not adding material to that dune area. Okay. It's just beach nourishment. The reason we're not going into that area is because the, the, the planned crest elevation of that berm is elevation eight. That's roughly what you have right now at the toe of those dunes where they sort along the line of where the revetment would be if it was continuous. So there's no so so the design doesn't include putting any material up there in those dunes right now. Okay. So in the would, future it would. But that would be, wait like, how far out? Like the larger north beach. Yeah, I mean the next project. time, hopefully the next time you know, okay. next time we get get to doing this, hopefully we could add more material add material there. Okay. Great. Yeah. Leslie, Thank one other thing on um, town of Marshfield, we have the drone. And we fly every year yeah, pre-storm. Right. That's a great and idea. And that also gives us a good idea of what the beaches look like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye. That's Leslie, a great monitoring tool. Yeah. If, if I could also mention, with regards to the amount of volume that's being put down um, now or, or un under this current project phase, um, because of the volume and the scope of the of of the overall project, it was always antici or anticipated, or it's my recollection that it was always anticipated that this project would be implemented okay. in phases, simply because of the amount of material that could be put down in any given construction season. Yes. So this is, in fact, proceeding along. Uh, the same sort of um, implementation scenario that had always been um, um, envisioned. So I don't want folks to sort of lose sight of that, that this is, you know, a piecemeal way of doing it. This has always been sort of the strategy of doing these larger scale nourishment projects until incrementally filling out that overall nourishment envelope. Yep, that's a really excellent point. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, that's true. So we'd always envision sort of phasing the project because uh, it's not realistic to assume we can bring in 480,000 cubic yards of material in the window that we have to construct this. I mean, you're talking about truck traffic now with 75 to 100,000, you know, that would be a lot if we're putting down 480,000. Ideally, someday we'll have an offshore borrow site where we can pump yes. the material to the beaches <laughs> and we can build the full project in one season. I mean, that's, that's what we really need for these sort of larger regional projects. And CZM is, is um, they've, they've got that, you know, they're, they're working on that. All right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sigrid Wheatley. Um, I'm the other Wheatley um, on 1548 Tremont. And um, my, uh, the only point I really want to make is the importance of the enforcement of the traffic concern. Okay. Um, because, as my husband pointed out, there was zero enforcement last winter, and we had trucks blaring their horns as they drove past our house um, daily, multiple times. And as my husband pointed out, there was one contractor in particular that was incredibly offensive um, in that regard and completely, um, you know, unbridled um, hmm. and um, and no no accountability. You know, we we voiced our concerns to DBR to Duxbury Police to Duxbury Construction, and we received responses um, from those communications, but there was no action, real action taken. Okay. Um, so I, I can't stress enough the importance of considering not just the, you know, the, the end result of the project, but what's happening on the ground during the course of that project, and that is all of the, all of the homes and businesses that are directly impacted by the truck traffic and from start to finish. All right. Yeah. Thank you. We'll uh, we'll make sure that that's communicated. Hi, um, Lee Larkin, Three Pine Point Place in Duxbury. Um, so, with the material being in front of the seawall at the southernmost point, what happens? The seawall ends and there's beach area there that a lot of us go to, will, we'll, you know, there'll be a huge mound of sand in front of the seawall. Will it be graded down or pushed into our area? So are you, so are you talking about at the end of the seawall or just yes. at the end of the project? At the end of the seawall. Okay, so we're not going to get to the end of the seawall this year. 
And you're, where are you going to end this year? Um, it was on one of the At slides. Um, it's it's roughly you know 2,700 feet long. Um, it's so about, it ends about Killians or past. I don't know where that um, is. Uh, there's the horseshoe area yeah. that. Okay, so it's 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 south of that. We hope. Right. Um, okay. Um, Sheila's going to try to pull that figure up here. So so we're not going to get all the way to the end of the seawall. Let's make that clear. But the end of the nourishment project will, yeah, that one, yeah. The end of the nourishment project um, will gradually slope down to the natural grade of the beach. So it's not like you're going to be climbing a giant hill to go, you know, along the beach and up to the top of the nourishment. It's going to be a gradual taper to the um, to the existing grade of the beach, both in the sort of the near shore and the long shore direction. All right. And this is what she so this yellow area here is showing on top of an aerial photograph. So I'm going to point. That's the horseshoe area. So it's what, 10 houses south of that? And th that's an estimate. I don't want anybody in this room to say that we're misleading you. Once we get those bids and we know what the volume of material is, we're going to adjust this. It's going to change. This is our best estimate at this point. Thank Which you. is why we would like you to make sure you give us your name and your email address for that pad of paper if it could keep going around. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I saw it there. <laughs> Hi. It's Dave Casalt, 1558 Tremont Street. I don't want to keep beating the truck drum, but some of the things that weren't said were the vibration. Um, when they hit the, a pothole or hit the town line, it really um, vibrates the house. And um, I think part of this, too, is at the stop sign at 3A. Um, all of that traffic in that area, um, the, the trucks are coming to a stop, and then they're starting back up again. And you could just hear the gear shifting you know, for 10 minutes while they're going by. By so, the old Jeep dealer? Yeah. Yes. So I'm just advocating for a contact either at the construction company or someone in town that can be kind of accountable to talk to these people or get the name of the rogue contractor and kind of get them off the list type of thing. Okay. All right. We'll make that clear at the pre-bid and, okay. and just, you know, try to find out who they're using and make sure that all this information is communicated to them and then we'll make sure you've got contacts at the town to reach out to. Okay. And I'm on And that if list. the um, yeah. person that knows who that um, trucking company was or the equipment was, if they could email that to Sheila and I, that yeah. would be helpful as well. Sure. No problem. Thank the, you. And did, the only thing I just want to add was I don't want to mislead people. So we're talking about very large 16-wheel trucks. They're going to go, I'm not an expert, but they're going to go through 16 gears from a dead stop, so if they're a right. complete stop, unfortunately, they don't make quiet trucks. Uh, well. The J break, the J break is the is the, is the problem that a lot of the people use it, and we have that problem in Marshfield constantly with people going uh, up and down to our transfer, and you know we have signs out there, and that's one of the things that we we can enforce, and we'll certainly be asking folks I know on the Marshfield side to make sure our police are enforcing that they're not using the J break. Once the contractors selected, we'll go through all of these, uh, both Marshfield and Duxbury, we'll go through all of these requirements and we'll be the onus of the contractor to make sure that the subcontractors, that, that all the drivers understand, you know, maybe we'll have something printed up so that the general contractor can get each of them, you know, where the speed limits are, what they have to, uh, they're not using the J-brake, um, how they go through the gears, you know, that type of thing. No, I appreciate that. Um, and I also appreciate the comment there are no quiet trucks, but my neighbor also alluded to some fairly large exhaust pipes that are a little bigger than most, and those are not legal, and they're not quiet. I'm not talking about a standard 16-wheel dump truck. So we'll be in touch. <laughs>
Uh, hi, Tom Kane, uh, 492 Keene Street in Duxbury. Um, just curious on the duration of an activity like this. I mean, I, I get that this was a five year, every, every five year to re-nourish if it was the original project. I'm just thinking about the longevity over the years. Does this ever have a situation, and, and I know there's a lot of variables that probably impact it, but does this ever come to a point where the erosion starts to slow down or you can hope in 30 years that we're not still having this conversation if we've done it every year or every three years. I mean, I, I, I'm just curious yeah, if I mean, there's that, projections that's a, that's for that. That's a good that. question. The rate of erosion is not going to change. It's going to get, if anything, worse, worse because with, of sea level rise the, yeah. and, and t increased, you know, intensity and frequency of storms. What we can hope for is that, you know, if we can do this project over a number of fa through through phasing, that we can build up enough of a reservoir of material on the beach. Um, to where it's less of a concern, you know, moving in these out years. Um, but I do think it's, it's you know, it's going to take a number of, of different construction events to, to get to that point. Hmm. Okay. Um, and, and, and also I would say that when we did that original study, you know, this was recommended as sort of a, a short-term, short-to-medium-term solution and that the town should be considering some other solutions for the you know medium and long term, and, and those are more difficult decisions to have. Um, but you know, given the rates of sea level rise and things like that, I think there are things that the town should, you know, pretty quickly start to start thinking about. Yeah, and maybe as a follow up, then, as if you had done the original project, I don't know how you would equate it, but the cost per cubic yard of you know material goes down the more you put on mm -hmm. um, would last that much longer or it's an, a sort of an exponential erosion so that when you do a small project it might only co you know cost you half the amount but it lasts two years had you done the full project it would have cost you double but you might have got five years out of yeah. it so is there a diminishing return the smaller you make these projects and the smaller and they so are the the, the do that they last they don't last as long as the bigger projects. But to do it right would be a more cost-effective yes. way to do it. Well, we just can't find the money. Can't find the money, and we don't have the source of sand or the mechanism yeah. right now to, to get the yeah, material to the beach. Right. Yeah. All and in one, one year, one season. That was a good point about the double the number of trucks or whatever it would take. Is yeah. That, that's a point I hadn't thought about. So thank yeah. you. All right. Hi, Beth Beninati from Garnet Road, Duxbury. I just want to say thank you for all your due diligence, knowledge, and hard work on this. Thank you. I really do appreciate that if you don't fortify these areas, the whole town ultimately at some point will be washed away. So I just want to say thank you, and I think we all need to think about the real big picture here, like you've been doing and all your hard work. Yeah, thank you very much. I've got to learn to walk faster. <laughs> I'm, I'm Harry Klebanoff, uh, 52 Assumption Road in Marshfield. A uh, couple of things. She said it better than I did, but thanks very much for the effort, the time. I read all the report. Uh, I appreciate everything that went into it and the funding. Uh, since I read all the... These guys. Hmm? All these guys were involved in that, so well, it's not I think, just us. I think I've come to know all these guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I also was at your presentation about a year ago. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this is going to be helpful and last, and I think it's a terrific thing. In order to make sure that we get the most out of it, my concern is also, as, as your report emphasized, for the protection, the integrity of the coastal wetlands that also offer a major absorption storm, sea level rise, all kinds of things especially in an era of potentially climate change, mm -hmm. uh, I want to make sure we're working at this from all the different perspectives. The chances of the nourishment lasting longer are going to increase if we protect and if we expand, fortify the, uh, uh, the coastal marshes. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to at least put that out there because I think it's an important way to make sure you get what the, that we get the most out of the project you're doing. Mm 
Yeah, that's a great, yeah, great point. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Leslie, if I might say, um, a, a number of the comments have focused on the longevity of the project. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that should be put out there for consideration is that in order to maximize the potential benefit, it would make sense to put as much sediment down as quickly as possible over the course of fewer years. So instead of waiting yeah. three or four or five years between nourishments to try and get down as much volume in successive years as possible. That's absolutely true, Jason. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's a that's a hint for the towns to sort of think about ways in which to build those capital funds. Um, and you know we'll be working with CZM and the towns to try to evaluate ways in which we can fund these project you know in in the near term in the next you know two three four years mm -hmm. so on the marshfield residence side what you're probably looking at is 300 to 500 thousand dollars a year potentially jeff dd 39 ocean road north duxbury um, we're fortunate enough to be behind the new section of the seawall, which is fantastic. And a lot of the nourishment is, is not going to be near us, which is, which is fine. Um, but I, am, I, I have seen a lot of the stuff that has gone on at the DBR. And I'm curious, the, the material that's being used, how does it, the specs compare to the material that they were specced to use? Because that material was not great. And as it eroded, it looks like giant rocks in and as it eroded these the edge of the nourished uh, space drops off mm -hmm. very steeply which if it was not able to be maintained uh, where I think they have open permits probably to grade that parts of that beach especially by Blakeman's if I'm not correct um, and we do not so I think that one, I know that the spec th that originally was used for the bidding on this has just been widened mm -hmm. to allow for coarser or a wider range of material, which uh, to me makes me very nervous having seen what they put at the DBR. And again, this is not going directly in front of my house or in our area. Um, and we're sort of okay right now. I think that the Green Harbor area and the Bay Ab area certainly need it. I'm just worried about what is going to be dumped there and whether or not it's going to be monitored closely. Um, because of the, if they put the stuff that was at the DVR and they are not able to maintain it as well, um, I, I think that it's going to leave a pretty ugly beach um, for sure until it washes away, really. Um, the the material that was used at DBR was on the finer was finer than what we spec'd for this project, so um, it's finer. It was finer than oh, what we. Oh, it's terrible. Okay, well I'm just saying that the material that was used at DBR when we plot the grain size curve, it plotted um, there were more fines in that mixture of sediment. I'm not saying. Oh, it by was, fines. Okay, I thought you meant sand. Yeah. So there there, were, there was more. Uh, finer grain material. There were still gravel and cobble in that in that material that was brought to the beach because that's what's on the beach and they were trying to match what's there. Um, this material that we've specified doesn't have as much as many a uh, higher percentage of fines as what was put on down at Blakeman's. Um, speaking to sort of, sort of scarp that you're talking about that you yes, saw. Significant. Um, we're hoping to avoid that by having that very gradual 15 to 1 near shore slope. And so that high water line is going to be hitting that very gradual 15 to 1 slope. And we hope to be able to avoid that scarping that you see in areas um, where maybe you've, you've got a steeper slope, you know, in that area where the high tide hits the beach. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there were definitely areas down there, and I have plenty of pictures of it where it dropped almost straight off, probably close to two feet. Mm -hmm. which on a recreational beach is, especially for people that are, aren't as mobile, is, is straight dangerous, especially if, it's no, if no one either in either town or whatever has either the ability or the interest to, to sort of maintain that periodically. 
and, and sometimes you will see that in uh, nourishment projects or right after they're put down, but it generally um, um, becomes more gradual and that scarp sort of goes away over time. So, um, you know, if that occurs here, I would expect that to sort of dissipate over time. Okay, we'll see. All right, any other questions? Okay, a couple more in the room. Can I ask one? Yes. <laughs> Steve Callahan, 12 Bay Ave. In the future, uh, all in all, this is a good thing. I think, I hope I speak for most of the people in the room. We need it, and uh, knowing that we're gonna continue to do this. Has there been talk of a pumping operation? I know it's done down south a lot more than, yep. it, I don't see it around here, but in lieu of all the truck traffic, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the big problem here. Isn't there, is it around or happening here in Massachusetts where we can get that sand that was here, it's right out there, and just pump it back in? It does happen in Massachusetts, not nearly as frequently, frequently or as at the scale that you see down south. Yeah. Um, we have been involved in some projects where we have had designated offshore borrow sites and we take a hydraulic dredge and we pump that material onto the beach. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was referring to earlier is that that's, the re that's really the way we can build this entire footprint, this entire project that we designed, you know, in one, in one or maybe two seasons, is to be able to designate an offshore borrow site and pump that material to the beach. And so that's something that, you know, people in state government are, are looking at and working on, and, you know, we hope to help, help them advance those ideas moving forward. So it's just a sort of not approved here? It, well, you have, to, you have to you have to um, identify and designate and permit an mm -hmm. offshore borrow site, and so that involves yeah, cool. a couple of years of studies of you know studies of the benthic organisms that are there. You know what sorts of sediment is there? Is it compatible with the beach? Mm -hmm. um, what Shelfish. you can imagine if you if you dig a big hole in the near shore area, is it going to cause the waves to refract and bend so that you focus wave energy in one area of the beach that's not there now, so you get more erosion in that area? So all those things have to be looked at. It's not a simple process, but it's certainly something that we've done and CZM has been involved with and, you know, in other states as well. So um, it's something that we hope will be advanced, you know, moving forward. Great. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> Rosemary Lally, 48 Bay Street, Marshfield. Um, this is mostly for the Marshfield people. Uh, the Rainbow Bridge, you're talking 30 ton trucks, 100 a day, going over that bridge. That bridge may have been done over, but it's held up by tree trunks. If you want to come in my yard and look, you're welcome to. Nobody has ever gone under there to check it. I've called town hall, I spoke to, <clears throat> I think it was an engineer with an Italian name, I don't remember. Rod Procaccino. Yes, <laughs> he said that they would come and check, which they never did. Um, I'm very worried about the bridge. No matter how you come in, you're gonna go by my house, because I'm right on the corner. The bridge is in my yard. Every time a truck goes over, my house shakes. I, I don't have a problem with it, it's part of living near the ocean, you know, we have things we have to deal with, but I'm worried about the bridge. So if someone from Marshfield could please go under that bridge and check it out before you start putting 60,000 ton, 60,000 pound trucks over the bridge, I'd appreciate it. I, I just want to address that. So just to be clear, both of those bridges were rebuilt by the state. I know, I saw um, them. And I, but I will check with DPW to make sure someone goes out, they have someone from the state come and check it, but they do meet all of the standards of today. I understand, the yeah. top of the bridge is beautiful. No, I mean, the, the structure yeah. of the bridge, ma'am, Underneath, et cetera. nobody yeah. ever went under there. Well, the, the state engineers did. I was there when they did the initial inspection before they did the work, and then why they did the work, and then when the bridge was finished on both of the bridges. Okay, and the other thing I've called about, which I don't know if those railings will hold all of this vibration, but the railings are rotten. As someone else mentioned, that the, the side pieces of wood, we'll yeah. have someone take a look at those. Yeah. I have called, I don't know how many times about the railings, and they okay. came, one piece is, has a rotten piece about that big. And yeah. the little kids climb up sure. there and look over yeah. to see the whatever's Fish. in the yeah. river. Before you leave tonight, can you just give me your name and phone number so I, I can get back to you? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
All right, any other questions from the audience here? I think almost everyone spoke, almost. <laughs> That's good. Um, let's see, Sheila, do we have anybody on Zoom who wants to ask a question? Maybe now is the time just to let those people who are viewing via Zoom that if you would like to raise your hand, um, please do so now and we can uh, put you on the screen and have you ask your question. Nobody so far. Okay. Doesn't look like anyone on Zoom has any questions, so I guess we're, oh, one more question, okay. Hi. Alicia Babcock, 9 Ocean Road South. Um, I wanted to just reiterate what everybody else said in terms of thanking everybody for your hard work. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I did want to just add a little bit to the traffic concern. Um, I'm all the way down at Ocean Road South that abuts the DBR property and um, their Garnet Road is very, very narrow. So yeah. in addition to the speeding, the trucks really, even if they're going slow, they, they really can't stay fully in one lane mm -hmm. because it, you know they're too wide. Um, and then at the end, there's a pretty good S curve that goes around Cable Hill. Um, and I had a lot of um, people, uh, because I'm, I'm uh, also a member of the Seawall Committee, I had a lot of the neighbors reach out to me um, with concerns about the traffic there. There are quite a few retirees that are living in the neighborhood now and you know they're they're, they drive very slowly and carefully and some about walking and I just want to make sure for safety reasons that um, you know there were a couple of pretty hairy close calls um, you know with them coming around the corner and the trucks not able to stay in the in the lane so um, I don't know if there's a way to even in just that one spot to, to kind of like you know post post something or maybe have a have a traffic person stationed there but um, you know just to get ahead of an accident yeah okay, would, would be would be good, um, good comment. And, and then um, and then I just had a, a question um, out of curiosity in terms of the um, the locations that you're drawing the the sand from um, how, how um, is it monitored uh, for um, you know, like hazardous material. How, how no. do you know that you're not bringing um, hazardous material from some of these locations? Are, are you testing at the gravel pits? Are you testing the, the sand on the truck? And if you do come into contact with something that isn't acceptable, what happens to that? It just, just, um, like, do you have to kind of halt the project for a while, or what, what happens? Those are, those are really good questions. Um, the material is tested sort of at the pits where it's created. And so we have a, a grain size data on that. Um, because we're asking for this more granular material, which is cobble, gravel, and, and granular sand with minimal amounts of fines, um, that's not the type of material that contaminants adhere to. You're going to find contaminants in these fine grain materials. It's going to adhere to the silts and the clays and things like that. So we don't expect there to be any, any contaminants um, it, it, you know, that, that are um, attached to these particles. Also, these sand and gravel pits are, are monitored and, in, in, you know, I think it's, it's documented that, you know, if they're selling their material, it's not got contaminants in it. Um, and so we don't expect any problem with that. Over time, we will be sort of looking at the, the quality of the material that comes in on the trucks. We're going to be monitoring that. As we're, as we're, you know, serving as construction managers and the towns will also be looking at this periodically. Um, if we see material that we feel is out of spec just visually, we're going to ask for additional grain size analysis from the contractor. If we see specific loads that seem like they're just not compatible, we're going to have them take them back out of the site. Okay, so will there be any testing like actually on the beach or anything after? And I'm yeah. asking for yeah. myself, but I'm also asking because some people expressed a concern last summer um, not knowing that the film that was in the water from the nourishment project down at DBR, that you know they were worried that the kids were swimming in something that yeah. was maybe not safe. So we don't just wanted to put people's people yeah. to, at ease about that. We don't have any plans right now to test the material once it's on the beach. Um, I think if we saw some sort of problem, we would certainly do that. But 
you know, I don't anticipate getting to that point. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bill Edwards, 25 Bay Avenue. Uh, is your presentation going to be on? Your visuals going to be online? Yes, it will so be on. online yes. for Marshfield. Yep. For Marshfield. Both towns will have yes. it on their website. Thank you. And we'll update those figures that show the extent of the nourishment footprint as well as soon as we get that information. Leslie. Yes. Hi, everybody. Lynn Fiddler, Select Board, Town of Marshfield. Before you all leave tonight, I would just like to commend all of you for showing up multiple times during this process, town meeting as well. This is not an easy process, and we're juggling a lot of different things. Leslie's been terrific, CZM, Greg, Mike Moresco, of course. Um, as we go through the process, I want you to remain cognizant of the things that we've talked about this evening. Feel free to reach out to us, and I'm sure that town of Duxbury feels the same way. So before you leave, just I want to just one last time thank you for being here, sharing your thoughts, sharing your concerns, and the traffic is a concern for all of us, and we want to make sure that everybody's safe as we don't go down Canal Street, Webster Street, whatever it is, not, not, I'm sorry, not Webster Street, Bay Ave, the whole, the whole um, route. So we'll be watching it carefully, and the compliance is also something that we will be um, taking, taking um, care of and, and monitoring as we go through the process. So have a happy holiday. Have, have, a, have a great time um, with all your families, and thank you for coming out tonight. Yep, thank you.